Thank you. Um, I will focus on a specific country. I'll focus on Vietnam, which is a, a very interesting country in the context of the land rights institutions because Vietnam experienced a very radical change, revolutionary change, I would say, during the period of the late 1980s and during the 1990s. And uh, for that uh, reason, Vietnam has received a lot of attention in the literature on, on, uh, on land rights. Um, so uh, what happened in the 80s and 90s was that in uh, following the, the Doi Moi uh, reform program in, in 1988, uh, land use rights were handed over from the agricultural collectives to uh, individual households. In 1993, a land law was uh, adopted, which meant that people were going to get uh, land titles uh, that uh, allowed them to uh, not only give people use rights, but also rights to exchange and to put up the land as security for, for loans and so on. Um, we see here the progress of land titling between in a period of six years from 1994 to 2000, the percentage of households with land use certificates, de facto titles going up from 23% to 90%. So this was a huge uh, change, um, which uh, and, and many people have looked at this and found generally that it was that it was not only impressive in scope but also had a number of uh, positive uh, effects during this period. So I'm going to uh, look at. Uh, what followed after this period of revolutionary change? Uh, what happened next? Were the um, um, that was the the, the 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 speed of progress kept up? Did Vietnam actually manage to fully complete the transition to a system of secure private uh, land uh, rights and uh, market-based uh, land uh, transactions? And uh, we show that, well, in fact. There is still now um, 30 years after these uh, reforms began, continued land, in, land tenure insecurity, evidence of corruption in land administration, still incomplete land trading, titling restrictions on crop choice, and continued land fragmentation. So there's still many things uh, to work with for the, for the, for the Vietnamese uh, government. So a little bit about the, the literature that looked at these uh, huge changes that took place during the, uh, the 1990s. We have, for example, Do and Aya that f document the rapid changes and find positive effects of land titling on investment in perennial crops and in off-farm labor supply. Rebellion and Van der Waale looked at these reforms in several papers, found that the post-reform land distribution, so after you went from uh, collective um, agriculture to household uh, um, land use rights, that post-reform land distribution was actually both egalitarian and close to efficient, there are remarkably few signs of corruption, they conclude. There is rising landlessness, but this is not mostly driven by, uh, by distress sales, but by pay people taking up new opportunities in the growing economy, so it's, it's, they conclude it's not a big problem. Klaus, uh, Song Chin Jin, uh, look at various issues, including the uh, land rental markets, find that they are actually quite efficient in terms of transferring land from the, uh, from the less to the more efficient uh, land users. Newman Tarp and Van den Broek also find positive effects of land titles and yields. So in general, it's a fairly uh, rosy picture of the effects of these land reforms in uh, Vietnam. So we look at, uh, we follow up on this and see, okay, are there, is everything really so, uh, so, so rosy? Uh, so we do this by using uh, a data set, the Vietnam Access to Resources uh, Household uh, Survey, which has been implemented uh, every second year from 2006 to uh, 16, This has been funded by the NIDA and by UNU uh, wider and implemented in uh, collaboration with um, local partners in, um, in Vietnam, of course. Uh, it's implemented in the rural areas of 12 uh, provinces in Vietnam, as you can see, covers uh, um, basically all areas of the, uh, of the country. Um, okay, so, so what do we find? So first, if we look at again at the effects of all these land titles that were handed uh, handed out, uh, we have nice data to do that because 
the virus collects uh, panel data not only at the household level, but even at the, at the level of the individual land uh, plots, the individual parcels, so we can follow individual plots and see what happens when a plot is, uh, gets a, a, a land title, does investment uh, uh, change? And so the LUC, this is the land use, where the plot has a land use certificate, a land title. We see there are indeed some positive effects on uh, whether the plot is irrigated, has some soil and water conservation infrastructure, not on perennial crops, but in general, the picture is that there are, we do find positive effects on investment goods of the, uh, of the land titles. So this is so far consistent with what other people found, that we see positive effects of the, uh, of the land titles. Okay, but then how about the, the continued progress of handing out land titles? Um, so this shows the share of land plots with a land use certificate. Uh, and the, 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 the black bar is for the entire sample, and then the other colored uh, or bar, the, the black line, the, the other lines are for the different uh, regions of Vietnam, with the Red River Delta and, the, and the, obviously the north or in the northern part of the country. Central Highlands and the Mekong River Delta are in the, are in the, in the south. And so this is clearly in, in, in contrast with what we see, saw on the first slide, where we saw rapid uh, progress. Here we see basically over the 10 years that we've considered, we see uh, a flat line. We see no uh, further progress, and we see still that uh, there's still a good fraction of, of land plots that have not been, been uh, registered, been, uh, been uh, issued with a, a land use uh, certificate. So we do see in Vietnam also what Klaus talked about, uh, 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 move back in some cases to, uh, to uh, informality. We know that there is uh, significant, from surveys, it suggests that there is significant corruption in, uh, in the land administration. You need to pay informal fees to get a land use certificate so that when people exchange land, there is a temptation not to go and have that change uh, registered and have a, an land title issue. These are, uh, land in, in Vietnam, land, uh, the land title is called Red Books. So, that's, so we have this strong communist symbolism on, the, on these certificates of private uh, property rights. That's, that's quite amazing. Okay, so there's a land title. So we, another issue that we have focused on a great deal is that is uh, whether people are allowed to grow, to choose which crops to grow on their fields. Because one thing is, as the land titles guarantee that you can that you have tenure security, you can exchange the plot. But another aspect is whether you can choose yourself what to grow on the plot. And this is uh, in the, and here um, economic planning still plays a very large role in in, uh, in Vietnam, despite all the economic uh, uh, pro market uh, reforms. We see the beginning of the survey, more than 50% of the plots in our survey, people uh, do not uh, choose what to grow on the plot. In, in, in the vast majority of uh, cases, they're restricted to growing rice. We do see some change over the period we've studied with a declining uh, trend, uh, but still toward the end of the, of the period, still around a third of plots um, uh, have restricted uh, crop uh, choice. Um, Clearly, with the issue of these, uh, of these uh, land use certificates, one thing that was expected was that land uh, markets, land sales markets would pick up and that eventually during the process of structural transformation, um, um, farms uh, would begin um, to, 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 to grow, farm sizes would begin to grow, would begin, begin to, be, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, uh, to go up. But we have, in general, we've, we see fairly active rental markets, but, in, in, but, we, but, but land sales markets have not picked up uh, very strongly. And we see that also reflected in the, in the, the, the development of farm size. So this is square meters, the average uh, farm size in square meters. So a, a hectare is 10,000 square meters. So we see that the average farm size in, 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 in Vietnam, at least in and our sample is, is, is very, very small. It's, it's only about a third of a, uh, of a, of a hectare and declining rather than, uh, than growing. And uh, this just shows the land sales market that the trend is, is basically flat over the period we're looking at. We do not see land markets uh, picking up uh, very strongly, um, uh, land sales markets picking up in, in terms of activity levels uh, very strongly. Um, even more uh, remarkably, if we look at here how do people part with their land? Do people uh, lose a plot of land? Uh, how does that uh, happen? We see 
Among the people who in 2016, the most recent uh, round of the, of the survey, among the plots that, that the households had, uh, had parted with, only 17% uh, in only 17% of cases, that happened through the land uh, market, the sales uh, market. And it, it's more common still, it's more common to be expelled from the land by the state than to sell it. If people expel, it's almost always by the state. So this shows that there is continued uh, issues of tenure insecurity and that the source of that insecurity is, uh, in the majority of cases, is the state. So this then, of course, uh, then begs the question, if there is tenure insecurity and the state is the source of that insecurity, what does it mean to be well connected to that state? What do these, Klaus also talked about political connections, the chiefs uh, being better off than other uh, people. In Vietnam, uh, we looked at the effects of having personal connections with, 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 with individuals with uh, political or bureaucratic uh, power. In particular, we looked at the effect of having a relative outside your own household, but a relative who has, holds some public office in the local uh, government. Um, and so these are regressions for how much of your land has a land use certificate, how much of your land has a land title, and then have, whether that's affected by having this connection. So we see no, there's actually no effect on, on, on the land titling. This is consistent with what uh, people like Revalian and Devalle concluded that, that, that there was uh, not a lot of corruption in the, in the distribution of, uh, of, of, uh, of land rights. But when we then look at de facto tenure security, were you actually expelled from your land? Did you actually lose land tenure? Then we see a huge effect, a large significant effect. Those who have uh, connections are much less likely to be kicked out of their, uh, of their land. So this suggests that there is... Um, and nepotism, there is corruption in, in, the, in the administration of land. Um, and what does this uh, um, uh, imply? Well, we look then at also what does, the, does it mean to have these political connections um, for your, um, for your uh, willingness to invest in your land? So we, we, we calculated how much people invest in things, the value of people's investment in things like uh, uh, water pumps, uh, perennial crops such as, as, uh, as uh, uh, mango trees. Again, looked at the effects of having uh, uh, political uh, connections on this, um, on this uh, variable. And again, we, we see strong uh, positive uh, effects that people who have political connections invest uh, a lot more in. In, uh, in their land. And this is, here again, we exploit the, the, the panel nature of this uh, data set so we can, um, we can follow, we can have fixed effects in the, in the models. We can follow individual households over time and see what happens when, if people gain or lose a connection, how, does that, how do their investment levels change? So these results are arguably uh, not driven by those uh, many uh, unobservable uh, household uh, characteristics that could drive uh, both your political connections and your, your, your um, ability and willingness to, um, uh, to uh, invest. Um, so we conclude that I mean, certainly Vietnam's land reforms were very far reaching and uh, they had a number of positive effects. We do not uh, dispute uh, this, uh, but the reform process was uh, never uh, completed. This is Trotsky. He believed that you know, in permanent revolution, but uh, of course he was killed because most communists did not believe in permanent revolution. And maybe the same is the case in the, in the, when it comes to land reforms in in, 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 in Vietnam, there was a period of revolutionary uh, change, but to an important extent, that, 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 that window of, of, of opportunity for rapid change has uh, shot, and things are now not changing so uh, fast. And you can argue that arguably the reform process was, has not yet been fully completed. There is still important issues of tenure insecurity. The source of that insecurity is largely the uh, government. Tenure, tenure security seems to depend uh, significantly on your political uh, connections. 
farms remain uh, extremely uh, small. This is an, an, an this is an important area, not just in Vietnam but also in other uh, countries. Um, Small farms may not necessarily be an issue, right? Typically, we have talked about the inverse farm size productivity uh, relationship. Small farms means that land is distributed evenly between a lot of uh, people. But on the other hand, farms of a size of only a third of a hectare may not be well, or are certainly not uh, well uh, uh, suited for using modern uh, technologies. So here we have a very important uh, issue of potentially um, uh, tensions between efficiency and, uh, and, uh, and equity. And perhaps if there are other things to do than farming, as there increasingly is in, 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 in a country like Vietnam, then perhaps equity is not uh, uh, necessarily a huge issue in terms of moving to, uh, to larger farm sizes. And this is something which is on the policy agenda also in Vietnam. Should you uh, do more to stimulate land markets? Should you, should you lift there's a land ceiling now, actually, but it's at three hectares. So at, for many, for most farmers, it's not binding. But but there are uh, things that can. Um, but but there are moves to to to, to make policy changes here. Um, so I mean, clearly, what is hugely remarkable about uh, Vietnam, as with China, is that we have seen such uh, dramatic economic reforms in land uh, institutions as well as in other uh, areas uh, without significant uh, political uh, reform. The political sy system in Vietnam remains uh, one, uh, one state authoritarian communist uh, uh, system. But so maybe this shows that there is, after all, political reform does, after all, constrain economic reform with this um, government in place. We are not going to see a, a, a fully, a, a complete, a fully completed move to uh, to um, to uh, fully secure private land rights, market-based transactions, and so on. So, that's actually about what I had to say.